Well, welcome to another edition of the Digital Sports Show right here on islandstats.com. I'm your host, Earl Bisden. And again, joining me is co-host Jason Juggling J. Ford. Well, J., we just survived a major storm. You got lights? Finally got lights. By seat. Most importantly, I've got the sun right now. Sun, little breeze outside. It's a beautiful day here in Bermuda. Three, four days ago, a totally different story. So now we're back to normal. And back to the action of sports. Yes. Uh, over the weekend, we saw the unveiling of the Olympic Wall at the National Sports Center and a gala night at the Fairmont Southampton. Having the opportunity to see our Olympians, everyone that's represented us in the Summer and Winter Olympics, displayed for the general public, gives you a sense of what? Pride. And we have talked about this. We've been banging that drum for many years now. Where is our pride that we need to show towards and appreciation to show towards the athletes who came before us and put us on the map? And this is one step forward in doing that. I think we've talked about it many times in different organizations of our Hall of Fame, um, a museum of sorts. Um, but we haven't seen something put in place. Now we can actually take somebody and say, look. And that's the start. So I want to commend everybody who's involved, but also the athletes, because now they can say, you know what? Their children, grandchildren, and generations to come. I just wasn't telling a story. I actually did this. Well, actually, let's get the report from Saturday. Bermuda Olympians and their families were joined at the National Sports Center, along with members of the Bermuda Olympic Association and government, for the unveiling of the Olympic Wall. Acting Governor Ginny Fairson, Premier of Bermuda Michael Dunkley, Minister of Social Development and Sport Sylvan Richards, Director of the Youth and Sport Norbert Simons, former Sports Minister Patricia Gordon Pamplin were all in attendance as the historic wall was displayed for all to see. Six swimmers represented Bermuda at the 1936 Olympic Games held in Berlin, and during the past 80 years, some 170 individuals have represented Bermuda in the Olympic Games. The Bermuda Olympic Association representatives have participated in every Summer Olympic Games since 1936, with the exception of the 1980 Games in Moscow. Bermudian athletes have participated in the following sports during the Summer Olympic Games that include athletics, Boxing, cycling, diving, equestrian, rowing, sailing, swimming, tennis, and triathlon. They are also participated in luge, skeleton, and skiing during the Winter Olympics from 1992 to 2010. Bermuda's lone medalist Clarence Hill's name has been edged on the wall in bronze. Later Saturday night, Jackie Jonah Kersey, the guest speaker at the 80th anniversary gala celebrations of the Bermuda Olympic Association, offered these comments to future athletes. You know what? Uh, my message would be to them is one, not to preach to them and two, to lay out the hard facts. There is no substitute for hard work. You might not be the fastest today, but if you come to practice every day, you will eventually see yourself becoming faster and stronger. But you got to make the commitment to working hard. And even when you think you have achieved a certain level, you have to still work hard. So if you're going to be out there competing, always know someone's going to be looking to take you down. But they can't take you down if you show up every day, listen to your coaches, do the work, and not try to find a shortcut. Because if you take a shortcut in sports, you would take a shortcut in life. Jay, on Sunday at the National Equestrian Center was the... CEA, which is the Caribbean Equestrian Association's Jumping Challenge. Uh, it is held in various countries around the Caribbean, and Bermuda took part. Um, let's get the report on how Bermuda done. Bermuda's round of the Caribbean Equestrian Association's Regional Jumping Challenge took place at the National Equestrian Center on Visa Street. The overall results will be provided once all Caribbean member countries have completed their competition. In Bermuda, Tyler Lopes, riding batteries not included, won the .75 meter class. Ariane Wilmot and Jack Frost finished second, while Emma Stegman and Jiminy finished in third. The .85 meter class was won by Kelsey Amos, riding Ruritaro. Helsinki, ridden by Bevis Tetlow, was second, and Eleanor Cox, riding Faceoff, finished in third. 
Elizabeth Medeiros powered Mr. Bentley to victory in the one-meter class. Casey Truin and Della Vega was second, and Dale Rochester riding Carolina Go finished in third. FA Cup. Uh, the game of chance, as you said it in our last show, a, a game that you want to see. Um, it, and it's an opportunity for those minnows to, to prove uh, or get that one-hit wonder. And on Sunday, proved one of those minnows can actually put up a fighting battle. Once again, I called it. I called it. No, it's good to see Butterfield and Vallis once again take our team to replay. I believe it's not the first time either, and I think we, in our next report, we will get more of the, the past history of them and when it's going to be the next replay date. But it's also good to see that sometimes when you play a lower division team, you take them for granted. That's human nature. I know Rangers will not be taking them for granted in the next round. Well, let's get a report from the four FA Cup matches as well as our English based players. Four games, nine goals, and a replay needed. First Division outfit Southampton Rangers will have to travel to BAA Field for the FA Challenge Cup preliminary replay after they were held to a 1-1 draw with Corona League team Butterfield and Vallis United at Southampton Oval. After a scoreless first half, Devon Roberts gave Southampton Rangers the lead in the 64th minute, but that was cancelled out in the 76th minute when Marco Matas scored for Butterfield and Vallis United. Down at the Wellington Oval, visitors Wolves advanced to the next round of the FA Challenge Cup with a 2-0 win over Hamilton Parish. It was 0-0 at the half, but Wolves would take a 1-0 lead when Kyle Brengman scored in the 54th minute. Marcus Ming would double the lead in the 88th minute to earn the win. Also at the Wellington Oval, St. George's Colts would advance to the next round of the FA Cup with a 2-0 win over the Paget Lions. After a scoreless first half, Donovan Thompson gave St. George's Colts the lead in the 47th minute. Thompson would then double the lead with a strike in the 90th minute to earn the win. At Garrison Field, Aaron Spencer gave Crossroads the lead in the 23rd minute against visiting St. David's. That lead was doubled in the 43rd minute when Antonori Butterfield found the back of the net. St. David's would pull within one when Diego McCallan scored in the 85th minute, but they would not be able to find the equalizer as Crossroads' name will go into the hat for the draw for the next round. Staying with football news as we take a look at our English-based players, Sheffield Wednesday denied Nicky Wells and his Huddersfield teammates a return to the top of the championship with a 1-0 win at John Smith Stadium. Adam Thompson scored his first goal of the season as South End clung on to a 1-0 Skybet League 1 win over Rae Simons' struggling Chesterfield. Simons was not in the squad. Casey Milan Butterfields also piled on misery for managerless Shrewsbury as Aaron Otmer, late winner, settled a bad tempered derby 3 2 in Walsall's favor. Butterfield was also not in Walsall's team. Reggie Lamb was an unused substitute as his 10 man Carlisle teammates edged out Hartlepool 3 2 in a thriller at Burton Park extending their unbeaten run to 13 games and equaling their best-ever league start. John Tay Smith was not in the team as his Welling United teammates squandered a golden opportunity to reach the FA Cup first round, going down 1-0 to fellow North League Southside Whitehawk. Roger Lee was not part of the Colby Town team that went down 2-0 to to Mickle Over Sports. On Sunday in Hamilton was the Argus Crime Stoppers 5K Run and Walk. Let's get a report on who were the division winners. Christopher Harris and Dion Brary are the 2016 Argus Crime Stoppers 5K male and female champions, while Quincy Kuzak and Jesse Marshall are the junior male and female champions. Harris clocked a time of 17.21. He was able to hold off a strong challenge from Spencer Butterfield, who was clocked in a time of 17.28. Youngster Robert Edwards was third in 18.33. Brewery finished 19th overall at a time of 19.58. Gail Lindsay was the second female finisher and 14th overall at a time of 20.21. Laura Wright rounded out the top three finishers, and she was 18th overall with a time of 20.39. Kuzak cruised to victory, recording a time of 8.19. Jake Brislane was second in a time of 9.38. Marshall finished third, stopping the clock in 9.58.
Paris Mitchell. Robinson was the third junior male finisher and fourth overall for time of 10-11. Jay Johnson was the second female finisher and eighth overall for the time of 10-53. The third female finisher was Dorian O'Shaughnessy, who crossed the line 10th overall, stopping the clock in 10-57. Well, really, everyone was a winner in the August 5K jug. Um, it's good to see so many people out taking part. Hey, definitely. Um, not just in the running world, but the partnership with Crime Stoppers. This is the 20th year anniversary. And just to think 20 years now, we have something that is a partnership between the public and the private. And this is something that's obviously helped us here on the island when it comes to crime. So please, folks, please keep supporting Crime Stoppers because we definitely need Crime Stoppers right here in Bermuda. It can be difficult choosing the right amount of data to fit your life. With Data Test Drive from Digicel, you can. Take us for a spin with any postpaid smartphone plan, and we'll give you all you can use data for the first three months of your agreement. When you come to the end of your three months, we'll let you know if you need more data on your plan and give you the option to increase your data allowance. Plus, our postpaid plans now include unlimited international SMS and increased international long distance minutes. Digicel, be extraordinary. Canada will arrive tomorrow to face Bermuda in 350 over matches. Jay, this is a lead up to Bermuda preparing for the Division 4, but Canada come in on a high having played USA winning the Aussie Cup 2-1. to one. Even though these are practice matches and we should be winding down exactly who will be representing us on the tour uh, later on this month, but right now we need a deal with Canada. And they're coming in here, like I said, on a high. So hopefully our boys are up to it. We have a very young team. Expectations. Right now, I don't have too much expectation because we do have a young team who's trying to gel and a brand new captain. So we get to see, and actually a captain coming off injury. So it's going to be quite interesting. Canada will head to Bermuda having retained the Aughty Cup with a 2-1 win over the United States. The Bermuda Cricket Board confirmed the rumors that have been floating around for a number of weeks that Bermuda will be hosting a three-match international series against Canada later this week. The tour serves as further preparation for the Bermuda National Squad prior to their departure to Los Angeles to compete in the ICC World Cricket League Division 4. The Canadian team arrive on Wednesday, October 19th with a squad of 15 players and will play three 50-over games in six days. The games will start at 10 a.m. However, the schedule is subject to change for Friday, October 21st at the National Sports Centre, Sunday, October 23rd, at Seabreeze Oval and Monday, October 24th, at the National Sports Centre. Meanwhile, Newport Cricket Club have announced their 2016 Cricket Awards with Bermuda's Kamal Lavrock earning the Scorers Award. Lavrock and his teammates were the 2016 South Wales Premier League double winners, crowned the league champions and the 2020 winners. The Scorers Award went to Lavrock for his performance during the 2020 final against Bridge N. Lavrock scored 57 off of 26 bowls, including 34 runs in six consecutive bowls. The other thing that we have to try to really battle is our spin. Our spinners getting wickets and our batsmen batting to spin. And I think this, whatever warm-up games, is going to see where we are because that's what's been our Achilles heel probably the last three to four or five years maybe. So to see how we bet against spin and how our bowlers spin the ball towards Canada. And I think what you're saying is you want a complete game and that's what it's going to take. A complete game um, to, to try and get our boys to feel as if they have a chance uh, come later this month in USA. Yeah, well, it's been quite interesting because when you see teams line up against us, most teams, depending on the wicket, they'll take roughly two spinners, maybe. But when they play Bermuda, they're taking four. It's a reason why. It's no secret. It's been out. So, it would like to see where we are in development. We would like to see how we are, have, you know, how we have progressed since the last tournament. And like to see where, where, where do we stand now going into the next tournament. Well, Michael Franklin took part in a squash tournament in Canada. Michael Franklin bowed out of the $5,000 men Black Knight White Oaks Court Squash Classic in Canada. Franklin took to the court, taking on the tournament's number two seed, Canada's Michael McHugh. Franklin went down in straight games 11-5, 13-11, 11-7. Jay, the 
Bermuda Rugby Football Union's league season continued on Sunday, but they had to move from the National Sports Center as it was supposed to be a girls' tournament there, and they hosted matches at Work Academy School Field. Let's get a report on the matches played on Sunday. Two women's division matches, one women's second division match, and two men's division matches produced a total of 99 points on the day. In women's division play, the police defeated the Mariners 3-2. to Police got two tries from Joe Murray and another try from Juanita Lau. Amanda Swan scored two tries for the Mariners. The match between the Renegades and the teachers ended in a 1-1 draw. The Renegades try came from Ashley Goddard, while Lauren Rothwell scored the lone try for the teachers. In the women's second division, the Renegades defeated the rest 3-1. Rachel Jenkins, Elaine McHugh, and... Maeve Dillon scored a try each for the Renegades, while Lyles Santana scored the lone try for the rest. In men's division play, police won the battle of the winless when they defeated the Mariners 34-17. The police got tries from Patty Graham, Johannes Othusen, Darren Richardson, Nick West, and Mandala Caesar. Tommy Edwards kicked three conversions and a penalty. The Mariners got two tries from Dylan O'Sh Kelly Lynch and a single try from Kellen Williams. Williams also added a conversion. The match of the two undefeated teams was won by the Renegades as they edged the teachers 20 to 17. Jimmy Baum went over for two tries for the Renegades while Peter Dunkley added the other. Brian Archibald kicked one conversion and one penalty. Corey Boyce scored two tries for the teachers. And Thomas Greenslade added the other. Connor McGowan kicked one conversion. Southside St. David's was the place for a lot of wheel action. When I say wheel action, it was cycling. The Bermuda Bicycle Association's route race season came to an end with a lot of action down there. Jay, it's the end of the season, so everyone wanted to get those final points in and lay that foundation for the 2016-17 season. You've seen them some Sunday mornings on your way home. <laughs> well, definitely. And you've seen the progress of a lot of riders. Um, some riders in the lower divisions who just come in like that, starting as a casual ride, starting to love the sport, and then really trying to get serious about the sport. And that's what I love to see, with somebody being introduced to a sport in a casual aspect and then want to become more professional about it. Obviously, you know that the riders, the top name riders, we see them every week dominating. But it's the other riders that actually make the race. And that's what I love to see, the progression of each rider in their own journey to get better and progress. It was no surprise that the A-category junior riders... Caden Hopkins and Matthew Oliveira took control of the race from the start with Hopkins jumping out to a quick lead and was joined by Oliveira to form a pair of winner's edge riders that were not catchable by the chasing peloton. Though Hopkins faltered midway through the race, leaving Oliveira to continue at the front on his own, Hopkins was able to hold on for second place and left the peloton to sprint for third which was taken by Darren Glassford also of winner's edge. Oliveira clocked a winning time of 30.05.2, Hopkins clocked a time of 31.43.9, and Glassford finished in 30.12.6. In the B race, the series leader and eventual winner, Adam Kirk, made an early move to remind the field that he was there to keep the racing fast. Though his initial move was shot down, he jumped off the front with a few laps to go and held off the effort of the peloton, securing yet another victory in 32.57. Kirk's teammate, Otis Ingham, took the sprint for second in 33.03.9, and Bicycle Works' Clifford Roberts rounded out the podium with a time of 33.04.4. Team Tokyo's junior rider, Zanine Burgesson, took a strong win in the C category where the final run into the line was a head-to-head -head battle between Burgesson and Paulo Madeiras of Winner's Edge. The 14-year-old Burgesson showed great determination in leading out of the sprint the final corner and then holding off a hard-chasing Madeiras with a time of 32.41.4. Madeiras was clocked in 32.44.5 and the third place spot went to Gareth Fleming at the time of 32.47.2. Rosanna Hoy continued to show her strength in cycling by taking the women's category ahead of Madison Digicel teammate Sarah Bonnet. Hoy clocked a time of 31.38.8, .8, 
Burnett recorded a time of 31.52.9, and Renda Roberts edged out Tristan Narraway for third in 33.25.4. Caleb Ingham won the junior A class with a time of 17.31.4, Tommy Marshall was second in 17.33.4, and Nicholas Narraway finished third, clocking a time of 17.43.7. Manning Smith recorded a win in the Junior B class with a time of 17.32.8. Megan Hans was second in 17.33.1. And Zoe Hausakos finished third in 17.34.9. Why choose Digisol Prepaid? Well, you get free social media usage, which means you can use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and WhatsApp for free without it affecting your data allowance. And for all your other online activity, we have the cheapest prepaid data in Bermuda. Digicel, best choice for prepaid. Well, also on tap over the weekend, Jay, was field hockey and the start of the 2016-17 ball hockey season. Field hockey takes place at the National Sports Center, ball hockey at PCC. Let's get those reports. In women's division play, the Ravens remain undefeated following their 4-1 win over the Canaries. Jessica Hollis gave the Ravens the lead in the 23rd minute with a penalty corner goal. The lead was doubled in the 38th minute when Eloise Pynchon scored from a penalty corner. The Ravens would go up 3-0 in the 42nd minute when Georgia Harris scored a field goal, but the Canaries would pull a goal back in the 45th minute when Holly Murphy scored a field goal. Jessica McClure would restore the Ravens' three-goal lead when she scored a field goal in the 55th minute. In the other women's division match, the Budgies came from behind to defeat the Sandpipers 5-2. Mandy Barker gave the Sandpipers the lead in the 18th minute with a field goal. Barker would then double the Sandpipers' lead when she scored her second field goal of the game in the 29th minute. That goal seemed to wake up the Budgies. Shira Simons pulled a goal back for the Budgies in the 35th minute, scoring from a penalty corner. Kishay Robinson would draw the Budgies' level with a field goal in the 40th minute. The Budgies would take a 3-2 lead in the 41st minute with a field goal off the sick of Francesca Kakachi. Maya Barker would give the Budgies a 4-2 lead with a field goal in the 55th minute and a penalty corner goal in the 68th minute off the stick of Robinson earned the Budgies the win. Over in men's division play, the Spartans would go down 3-1 to the men's A-team. Dunny Simmons would give the Spartans a 1-0 lead with a 20th minute goal from a penalty corner. Joe Fernandez leveled the score at 1-1 with a field goal in the 33rd minute. Dave Tyler would give the men's A-team a 2-1 lead in the 67th minute with a field goal. And when Fernandez scored a field goal in the 68th minute, it made the final score 3-1. Meanwhile, the 2016-17 Bermuda Bowl hockey season got underway at the PCC hockey rink with a triple header that produced 24 goals. In the opener, the Gatineau Olympics defeated the Tri-City Americans 12-3. The Olympics were led to victory by Christopher Merritt, who scored four times. J.M. Tremley added a hat-trick. Bill Kalok and Craig Rowat both scored twice, and Max Bovin scored the other. Craig McNeil, Aben Vera, and Christopher Jackson all scored a goal each for the Tri-City Americans. The second match of the evening saw the Vancouver Giants shut out the Oshawa Generals 8-0. Brian Keats scored twice to lead the Vancouver Giants to victory, while Peter Waltliff, Stephen Chin, Cameron Poland, Corey Collette, Chedge Cunliffe, and Goose Shannon all found the back of the net once. The final game of the night saw the Halifax Mooseheads defeat the Serena Sting 1-0 with a lone strike from Jeffrey Looper in the first period. Well, Jay, the Olympics might be over, but our Olympians still have messages to deliver. Now let's join an interview with the Olympic rower from 2016 in Rio, Shelly Pearson. Well, welcome to the segment of the Digital Sports Show. I'm here with Olympian, I can officially say that, Olympian, Shelly Pearson. Shelly, a lot of people know of you, but I want to use this opportunity for people to get to know who Shelly Pearson is. Now you've 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 been to the mountaintop. I could say that you've been to the Olympics. <laughs> yes. Um, let's go back. What? How did you fall in love with the sport of rowing? Right. 
Uh, so when I was in, when I grew up here, I was a swimmer mm -hmm. primarily. I did some triathlon, cycling, and field hockey and stuff as well, but primarily swimming. And I worked really hard, but I wasn't super good at it. Um, but I kept trying. And when I went away to school, um, I was tall and I was relatively athletic, even though I couldn't throw or catch a ball for my <laughs> life. And I wasn't amazing at swimming. Uh, and my dad suggested I try rowing. And once I started rowing, it was a sort of perfect combination of being on the water, which was something that having been from Bermuda, I was always in the water, on the water, you know, involved with the water, mm -hmm. that I absolutely loved it. It was, and it, it um, I ended up being surprisingly good at it, yeah. I suppose. And it was, I had the finesse for it on top of the, the love for the water, and uh, I also enjoyed the teamwork aspect to it that I hadn't necessarily found in swimming and stuff before. So it was really when I, when I went away to school, and after I think it was um, my novice season, we won our final race, I guess, and that was that was just amazing. <laughs> and I, at that point, was still terrible. I mean, like we were novices, we weren't actually very right. good. Um, but that was, I guess, sort of the start of maybe believing I could be. <laughs> right, right. What when you were getting ready to leave the first school? Were you looking to say which school had the better program for not only education, but a rowing program as well? Yeah, so I actually went to the same school that Roy Allen Birch and Rebecca Sharp yes, went to. Yeah. And I went there with the eye of doing sports, for sure. I did think I was going to swim, and then I decided that I wasn't good enough, really, to dedicate my whole life to swimming. I wanted to try other sports. Ultimately, I tried rowing and then ended up dedicating my whole life to <laughs> rowing, but you know, it worked out for me in yes, the end. <laughs> um, and I didn't know I had happened upon a school that at that time had an amazing rowing team. My first year, we were very, very small, but my first year as a novice, I was on the novice squad with the varsity squad. They won the national championship. So they were the fastest four in the country. Right. And so I went into a system where they were achieving great success, sort of you know, surprisingly to everyone. Right. <laughs> um, so I was quite lucky that then I was in a program. And then we hired a new coach my second year there. And she was an Olympian. She had been to multiple Olympics rowing for the States. And so I got, you know, exposure to this incredible coach. I got to then go in. I then made the varsity boat that we then went and we won the national championship two more times and got silver a second time. Uh, so I was just incredibly lucky to have been a part of the program at that time. And I bet I had no idea <laughs> going into that. At times, did you feel intimidated because you were coming from a different sport and trying something new? Certainly my, my second year rowing, I was, the in, I was the newcomer to the boat. So the other three girls, who were, it's a boat of four, mm -hmm. uh, I guess five with the coxswain, and the other, all the other girls had just won the championship the year before. And I was the mm. only different person. <laughs> and I was terrified because I felt like if we didn't win it again the, that year, then it was all my fault. Right. That I was this, whatever, 15-year-old, <laughs> like 15, 16, and that it would be my fault. And these girls were all older than me. They were all primarily actually in their final year. They, mm -hmm. Most of them were 18. Mm -hmm. um, so I was absolutely intimidating. I was much smaller than them, and it was terrifying. But by the time I was a senior, I was that, I guess, scary, large, intimidating person. <laughs> I didn't want to be. I tried not to be. But um, So my, my second year, uh, particularly, I felt that way, but not so much after that. How much of a difference is it rowing on, say, the Hamilton Harbor and rowing at the high school you were at first? Uh, quite different. I was rowing on a lake, so just in general, obviously right. a lake versus a harbor is going to be quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, the lake is much calmer, and it was built for rowing. It was, a, you know, um, that was its intention. So we were quite lucky there. But having said that, I at Oxford we trained on the Tideway, which is an entire beast <laughs> of its own. Yeah. I swear to God, that body of water is alive. <laughs> um, so that is much more similar to the harbor. So I have rowed on both. <laughs> right. What made you decide Oxford? Uh, over Cambridge or just in general? In general. In general. Okay. Um, growing up, I always knew about the Rhodes Scholarship mm -hmm. from Bermuda. And so that was where I first sort of 
you know, knew about Oxford and was intrigued by the idea of it. And then in college, um, they, the two things happened. First was that it was declared that the women were going to get equal funding to the men for the rowing team mm -hmm. and that they were going to be on the tideway for the first time in 2015. Right. And prior to this to this 2015 race, the women raced in a different weekend. They only raced 2,000 meters instead of the 6.7. It wasn't televised. It you know it it had it was they did an amazing job, but it was not the equal. Right. It was not at all equal. Right. And the men's Oxford Cambridge boat race was this quite famous thing. Yeah. And so that was when I was like, oh, <laughs> that would be pretty cool in that you know to be there during that time. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing was that they came and visited uh, Harvard, and so I got to meet the coaches, and I got to learn a bit more about the program, and became quite excited about it. Uh, I still was not set on it, though, um, after I graduated college, and I applied for master's programs in the States and in the UK, and then... It sent, I got in, I got into all the programs that I wanted to, and so um, it was a bit of a difficult choice between them all, but the Oxford program was substantially cheaper, number one, because mm -hmm. it has the British right. tie, right. Um, and number two, it was one year, and number three, it was in that year of the first Oxford Women's Boat Race. <laughs> so it, was kind of, it then became like a kind of a no-brainer, no in my opinion, right. because I was getting this amazing degree on top of all of these other things. Right. Um, so I guess that. <laughs> It can be difficult choosing the right amount of data to fit your life. With Data Test Drive from Digicel, you can. Take us for a spin with any postpaid smartphone plan, and we'll give you all you can use data for the first three months of your agreement. When you come to the end of your three months, we'll let you know if you need more data on your plan and give you the option to increase your data allowance. Plus, our postpaid plans now include unlimited international SMS and increased international long distance minutes. Digicel, be extraordinary. What did you do leading up to that um, year in school? What, what was your summer like heading over there? Horrific, actually. Uh, so I, I graduated from Harvard in 2013, and then I, I, I worked coaching and just sort of odd jobs enough to pay the bills mm -hmm. and um, was training full time. Uh, but in college, my senior year, I was diagnosed with an aneurysmal bone cyst, which is essentially a cyst that eats away from my bone, my, it was my pelvic bone from the inside out. So mm -hmm. I had a super weak pelvic bone and I had, I must have had, I don't know, six surgeries maybe during my senior year of mm -hmm. college and thought I was better. And so I went into this year training full time, doing really well and I made substantial gains. I was, you know, it was awesome. Yeah. And then in April, before I was supposed to leave for Oxford, I, it came back. And so I had to have surgery in April and my doctor told me that I needed to take time off, that I was, it was not healing, that this was, you know, I, I needed to take this much more seriously, I suppose, than I was, because I was kind of in denial right. of the situation. Like, like anyone else, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so after that, I had to get a job, and I moved to Philadelphia, and I worked through the summer, and I wasn't allowed to train, so my training consisted of a bike ride to practice, to, the, to work, I guess, which was like a 35-minute bike ride, so right. it wasn't like I wasn't doing anything, I guess, but it, to me, it was nothing, nothing and I wasn't yes. rowing, yes. so I was out of the boat at that point for quite a few months, and then I had to get a checkup again at the end of the summer in August, and it was still quite bad, so I had to have another surgery. Uh, but this time I had complications from the surgery and I ended up, uh, fracturing it. I had to go to the emergency. I was in Bermuda when it started to flare up really badly mm -hmm. and I went to the emergency room here and they didn't know what to do with me. So I had to fly up to Boston to go to the emergency room at the hospital that was normally treating me. Mm -hmm. And basically... Through the fracture, what they inject me with for these surgeries had leaked out. So I had both a fracture and muscles that were leaked with an inflammatory. So it was just an excruciating pain and I had to be on put on crutches. Right. Uh, at this point, I was supposed to be leaving for the UK. I think the day I flew to the emergency room in Boston was the day I was supposed to fly to the UK. Mm -hmm. So instead of going over, I because I would have gone over 
a month early for right. training right. before school actually started. So instead, I came back to Bermuda, and I was in Bermuda for a month on crutches doing absolutely nothing. And then I flew to Oxford. My poor dad had to carry all of my bags because I was still on crutches and couldn't carry absolutely nothing. Um, and was there, uh, and I think I got off of crutches by November and then was able to start training sort of at the end of November. And at this point, I had five months to get back in shape and to make the boat. So the summer before was, was not so fun. Right. <laughs> At what point in time did you say to yourself, "It's not going to happen. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be on that river uh, that first time where where it's an equal race." I don't know if I ever fully said that to myself. Actually, I think I was scared that I wouldn't be, but I I refused mm -hmm. to. To not be, right? right. <laughs> I guess <laughs> there were definitely some very low moments. Right. I erged, which is the indoor rowing machine, uh, for ten minutes, and I swear I couldn't walk for a week. I was wow. in so much pain. And normally, you know, ten minutes is nothing. Yeah. Normally, we're doing eighty minutes twice a day, kind of thing. Like <laughs> this was not good news. Right. <laughs> if right. I couldn't do it for ten minutes and. I was sore in muscles I didn't even know I could be sore in <laughs> um, for a long time afterwards. But I still didn't, I don't know, I didn't know how I was going to do it necessarily, but I still, I still refused to believe that I couldn't do it. What extra stuff did you do? Because your, your teammates were already ahead of you fitness-wise, strength-wise. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. were some of the extra things you were doing to ensure that five months you were doing everything possible to ensure that you was going to be in some sort of shape to be able to help your teammates right? and still get the education side. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I met with my physio a lot. My physio, Catherine, is a godsend. Mm -hmm. She is amazing. And she, she was sort of, she helped me through all of it. So I was seeing her and doing loads of exercises and things like that to try to strengthen the area. I was just quite diligent at everything I was doing um, in practice. And so I, you know, I did, I did everything to a T, I suppose. And I knew I didn't have much wiggle room because of the time. I was quite lucky that for whatever reason, I was, I genetically was able to get the fitness back much, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I had built up such a, large fitness base the year before where I was when I was training full time and so I didn't get back to you know my peak shape it, at that point in time but I ended up not being far off mm. which was just I didn't know that my body would would react that way and that I would be able to do that but I was very fortunate and I worked really hard to do that I guess you get you get to start the race so um, what's the night before like because I know your teammates you're all buzzing you're all mm -hmm. excited what's the night before like we were trying to stay calm as much as possible mm -hmm. uh, we actually had this tradition where we alumni or uh, other people sort of involved with the club would send us letters and so we would read letters at the dinner the mm -hmm. night before mm -hmm. to you know think about all these other people and the most the, the the thing that sort of stood out to me the most was that it wasn't just the nine of us in the boat it was actually everyone who had ever come before us in that boat with us uh, the following day and so it was sort of those sorts of things we were we were mostly just at that point trying to stay calm we had done everything we could possibly do to be ready for the following day and at that point it was just eating a good meal and keeping calm in the lead up did you guys have you went in the drink didn't you Sorry? You went in the drink? Yeah, like yeah. We, we sunk. Sunk, yeah. yeah, in the lead up to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Was that a day where you would have normally not, had it not been such for the big event, you would have normally not gone out, or is it just one of those things that happened? It was just one of those things that happened, to be honest. Um, and I, if anything, as much as it caused a lot of, you know, media havoc, <laughs> um, it was really, it was a great bonding experience right. for us as a boat. Right. So I wouldn't really take it back. And it's a great story <laughs> now. Um, and it wasn't dangerous. You know, if it had been dangerous in any way, then right. that would have, you know, changed it right. a bit maybe. But it wasn't dangerous at all. It happened to be a relatively warm day. Right. And we were all 100% fine. Right. So 
it, it, it was just a great bonding experience for all of us. And I Not think we were laughing. Back at it. Yeah. I mean, even then we were all laughing and we oh, were, okay, you know, okay. I mean, we, we knew we were fine. It right. wasn't, we knew we were fine. We right. thought we were like, wow, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> so the race starts. Mm-hmm. You're, after about three or four minutes, you guys have given yourselves a lead. Five minutes in and you, you've got this huge lead. We could, watching it, you could hear the coxswain on the boat, but what goes through your mind? You're still working hard, but don't tell me you didn't look. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm I'm notoriously bad. My teammates will all tell you I'm really bad about keeping my head. I try. I really, right. I do try to keep right. my head in the boat. Right. Um, yeah, no, we, we knew. Um, the problem was a bit is that there was, we were expected to have right. that kind of a lead, right. so it didn't necessarily... Um, surprise you. Yeah, it didn't really surprise us. And if we hadn't, it would have been, you know, we were, we were trying to prepare ourselves for if we weren't to, you know, it's a long race. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of room. Right. Um, but I guess what I was really thinking, probably not five minutes in, but more like seven minutes in was mm-hmm. how much more there was still to go, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Because there was a tricky part to the course, wasn't it? Under the bridge and to, what did you make, a left or or right. You turn left no. through Hammersmith. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Um, and at Hammersmith, you're 2,500 meters in. Mm. Now, a normal race is 2,000 meters long. Right. Right. So, mm. the racing that I did at the Olympics is all 2,000 meters right. long. And in rowing, um, you can race head style racing, which is the typical long racing. So right. actually, head of the Charles is a really famous one, yes. and that's in Boston yes. this weekend. And that one, you go off one by one, and you race over five thousand meters. Right. And when you race it one by one, you're pacing yourself a bit mm-hmm. because they're you know you're not side by side, so you don't really have the same sort of tangible competition. Right. But the way it works with the boat race is that you have to race it like it's a 2,000 meter race where you're side by side because you want to get, there is so much advantage to getting ahead based on the line that Mm -hmm. you can take and all these things. Um, And there's a very large mental component to it because you can like psych out the other, your opponent and all this stuff. So you, we raced it like a 2K race, but then it's actually (laughs) 6.7K. So there were a lot more K that had to happen (laughs) after that. So going under Hammersmith, I just remember, I mean, we were 2,500 meters in, which already at that point is longer than a normal 2,000 meter race. We had a lot longer to go. (laughs) Um, And I was in a lot of pain (laughs) already at that point. So I I was just kind of thinking, you know, like got to keep, like keep those legs pushing down and keep, you know, don't catch a crab, I guess, because that's when your oar gets stuck, Um, which no one did. And we were absolutely fine, but the water gets a lot choppier too through that area. So you have to be a lot more controlled Mm -hmm. and calm, which is um, what I was thinking about or what our, what our poxin was calling for at that point in time. (laughs) Shouting at you, screaming at you. Yep. So you, you, you get through that, you, you've, You've achieved something remarkable for the, for, this, for the club, for the school. Then the opportunity of rowing single mm-hmm. for Bermuda in the Olympics. Come, when does that come to mind? When does that start to flicker in the, in the head that hey, maybe I can do that? So it's actually been something that I'd been thinking about long before 2015. Right. Uh, and I spent all my summers in college rowing the single for that fact. So okay. it, was, it was always in the back of my head as right. this thing that I would definitely need to be in the single to do it, so I better right. learn how to row the single. <laughs> um, so I spent my summers sculling, which is using two oars versus mm-hmm. using one oar, right. which is what most college teams do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had I had been thinking about it for quite some time before that. And I guess after the boat race, a couple of different things happened, and I got into the MBA program. Mm-hmm. And once I got into the MBA program, then I had to figure out how I could row and do the MBA program at the same time. And I needed to talk to my coach about it and see how I could make all of the logistics work. Mm-hmm. And once I had all the logistics down, then it became like, okay, like we can actually do this. Let's make a timeline. And I got it was a bit confusing because at first the um, the qualification regatta on the schedule said that it was going to be in November, right. and so I was like, oh, maybe I could actually do both, or how would I manage this? But then the qualification regatta ended up being in March, which ultimately was definitely the better way to go because mm-hmm. I still had a dissertation to write from my first degree due in August, so right. that would have not left very much time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but that meant that I definitely couldn't do the boat race in 2017, 2016, right. which was fine. Um, but I had, I sorted out all the, the logistics, I guess, and started, you know, chugging away at it come September. Why choose Digicel Prepay? Well, you get free social media usage, which means you can use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and WhatsApp for free without it affecting your data allowance. And for all your other online activity, we have the cheapest prepaid data in Bermuda. Digicel, best choice for prepaid. The Olympics takes a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifice, um, something that, that's not new to you because you have to do that for, for college and so forth. How much more pressure was it preparing yourself after you had reached the goal in Chile and, and qualified? How much more pressure were you putting on yourself to ensure that you were in the right frame of mind? You still had school because you still had exams to do and so forth, but mm -hmm. how, do you, how did you, what were some of the things you were doing to prepare yourself for that challenge? It's mm, a good question of how, well, there was definitely a lot of pressure surrounding all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, probably mostly put on by myself, mm -hmm. but also just there was a lot of external stuff going on that logistically were really challenging uh, in terms of you know making sure my boat was going to arrive and what my uniform was going to look like and that it got approved by everybody and the colors were all correct and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was a lot more stressful than I had sort of imagined it was right, going to right. be. These are not things that rowers normally have to deal with. Mm. Normally they have a big team behind them right. and it all happens behind the scenes right. and all I have to do is show, show up and row. Yeah. Um, but now I had all these other things going on. And so that was that was quite difficult. But I guess uh, after Chile, I sort of um, continued on doing the same thing that I'd been doing before Chile until my classes ended. And I did... I finished classes, I guess, a month before racing actually started and two weeks before mm -hmm. I left for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was very lucky that my, my coach, who was out in California, who had been working, so I had a coach, the Oxford coach, right. and she didn't, she didn't physically coach me much, but she was the one sort of there with me day to day. And then I had someone who was working just with me out mm -hmm. in California. Right. Um, and the woman out in California had a good friend of hers who uh, uh, was a couple, and the woman had rowed for the United States uh, as a lightweight in mm -hmm. 2012, and the man had been in the 2008 and 2012 Olympics in the single and had just missed qualifying for 2016 for the U.S., mm -hmm. and they were already in Europe. So they actually came out to Oxford with me, and I was able to do pieces against the woman in the single, and the man was coaching us. And so I was, it was the sort of the perfect setup for me to be able to do lots of racing pieces with right. someone next to me right. to practice as much as I could what it would be like mm -hmm. in Rio. And we were on the uh, 2012 Olympic course. So I was able to train at Dorney, which is where right. the 2012 Olympics right. for rowing were, were held. So you get to Rio, you see the course. What were some of the thoughts of your, what was going to challenge you the most? Firstly, it was probably the most beautiful rowing venue I've ever seen, mm -hmm. but also Tideway aside, <laughs> the roughest <laughs> venue I've ever seen. Yes. Tideway is its own beast. Right. It's, it's really, I mean, we use pumps on the Tideway to right. pump water out of the boat because you are actually worried about sinking. Normally, you would never have pumps in the boat. Um, and yeah, so I knew, I knew within a couple of days that the water could be anything from absolute still glass to terrifying water. And it was a gamble we were going to have to play and I had to figure it out, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, and it took a while. It wasn't really until, I guess, even two days before racing, and then even the first race wasn't amazing in it, I had to sort of get myself together, that I, I, I actually heard a boat going out, it was an eight going out, so they're like mm -hmm. a big stable boat, right? right? I'm in this little, little <laughs> tiny thing. And they're on the dock complaining about the water. And I was like, <laughs> you're complaining about the water. <laughs> Um, I was, so I was like, you know what? Like, I'm going to go do this. Like, right. I have to go do this. Like, right. they can be a bunch of babies. Like, I'm going to go out and do this. And so I just had to figure out how to row in it. Right. <laughs> right. 
So you're on the start line for the first race that morning. Take us through it. Not the race, but just your thoughts from from dock to start line. Ah, uh, that was the worst race in terms of weather mm -hmm. by a long shot. Mm -hmm. I had rode. I went to the World Cup in Poland, mm -hmm. and it had been really scary water there. And I was like, oh, you know what? Like, this will be. The, it has to be the like. This will be the worst I've ever. I'll row in. Like, I'll make it through. Right. Rio was worse, <laughs> um, which I did not anticipate, right. and that it could be worse, and right. they would send you out in. Uh, on the warm up, I was—I mean, I was terrified. Like, I—I I, I was absolutely terrified. My boat was filling up with water. I probably had this much left between the water in my boat and the top of my hull. Right. So I was just sloshing water everywhere. Right. Uh, the buoy line was such that it was attached by a rope rather right. than just being separate buoys mm -hmm. so we were getting pushed into this buoy line but once you got in it you had to pull your oar in to get it back out oh, and over right. this thing we were getting stuck in it and pulling your oar in means you're super even more unstable in these already massive white capping waves yeah. so everyone was i mean we weren't able to warm up because you couldn't do bursts right. in these kinds of like you could not physically row at a high rate in right. these kinds of waters for fear of flipping and everyone around me you know we were all rowing at like quarter slide just trying to get to the start line yeah. Uh, and a lot of the girls, you know, we were like, is this really, are they, are they really running this in this? Like, is this, is this for, is this really happening? Um, I got to the start line and I had to spend, I'm not kidding, five minutes bailing out my boat wow. of full of water, which is, you know, these are not, this is not a great way to calm the nerves right. before right. my first Which Olympic panic. race. You're panicking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it was, it was comforting to see everyone else panicking. Right. I mean, all right. of the, all of the, you know, Olympic medalists were also right. not super comfortable in these waters. <laughs> so that was at least something. Um, and going into the going into the starting docks and sitting on the start line, I knew what I had to do to to get through. Mm -hmm. And I basically wanted to stay, I was trying to stay as calm as possible through the body of the race where the water was the worst. Mm -hmm. And I knew it would drop out and that the last bit was protected, and right. I knew I needed to keep myself in a position where I could make a move and actually row in the water that was rowable <laughs> in the last 500 meters, I suppose. It was a bit unnerving that the woman in the lane next to me got out of her boat on the start platform and had them like lifting it up and shaking all this water out and stuff like that because she had had so much water in right. her boat. And we all probably should have done that. She was right. smart to have done that, but it delayed the race. Uh -huh. So we were sitting there for a really long time, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, right. sitting there, which is always unnerving. But this was, you know, for that much longer right. with all of these conditions around us. Um, and then through the race, I... I couldn't believe we were racing in those kinds of conditions. I mean, it's not rowing, you right. know, it's survival right. at that point. It's really just trying not to flip. Mm -hmm. I got went into the girl's lane next to me because I got stuck, you know, like the waves were taking us. You just absolutely right. get taken with the wave into the other lane. You're trying to pull yourself around. Right. <laughs> this is not, these are not normal things in, <laughs> in rowing racing. Um, but I was able to stay up enough and go in the last 500 meters, mm -hmm. which was really all I wanted. And I was very grateful to not have to go through the repechage. Right. Do you, can you hear the announcer um, singing out to the crowd? Because they had loud speakers, mm -hmm. and obviously. But can you hear that where you're situated or because they had big screens as well? No, 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 you no. can't. You no, you can hear that there's noise, you right. hear noise, but right. you don't hear your own name and you don't really, you don't have any idea what's going on. And it is tricky in rowing because you obviously face backwards. backwards right. So there's a, you know, it's a fine line between looking to see where you are right. and understanding, you know, how, what you need to do to get mm -hmm. yourself in a different position, but also not rowing poorly by looking. Because right. if I look like this, then my shoulder drops and right. my, or, you know, maybe I'm pulling a little bit harder on one side than the other side. Right. And mm -hmm. so then I'm turning, yeah. like something like that. So you have to sort of be careful about it. It would be great to have it just like tell me, you know, where I am. But unfortunately, we don't have that developed just that yet. Last, that last 500, yeah, 500 meters, I have to say, uh, it kind of, it's to see the power in which you almost got like a second burst of energy and just powered your way through. 
<laughs> it wasn't really. I mean, in the heat. So in the quarterfinal, the heat, yeah. it was that. But in the heat, honestly, like it wasn't necessarily even that. Hard. You literally couldn't row hard right. for the first part. So it wasn't really a first. It was like a finally using my energy. <laughs> okay, I okay. would say I don't know that I would call for, it a first. Where where we were situated, obviously, we were in the area where it was flat. Mm-hmm. The wind was being blocked by both on both sides. Mm-hmm. So it. it for, for what I saw from the distance and then you get into that area and all of a sudden it's like, oh, she's moving faster. She's, you know, mm-hmm. so for me it looked as if it was that second burst of energy where you're saying now it was that burst of energy you needed to, because uh, yeah. you were in the waters in which you're used to. Yeah, yeah. in which you can actually row. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the quarterfinal, we, we get to that stage, another nervous night. Yeah. So the quarterfinal, I knew it was my do or die. Mm-hmm. And the quarterfinal was my final, right. basically, because either I got through and I didn't or I didn't. And um, anything getting through would be, you know, icing on anything after that point would have just been icing on right. the cake. And if I didn't get through, then I didn't get through. But I had to certainly do my best to, to, to try. Mm-hmm. Um, so the night before the quarterfinal... Yeah, I don't think I slept loads. Um, But I don't really worry about those kinds of things because Mm -hmm. more than anything, it's the night before the night before that matters, we always say. And I did get a good night's sleep that night. And so the night before, like, I knew I'd be fine on the day of, even if I'd only gotten three hours of sleep. Like, I would be fine. And that's just from a lot of practice and stuff that I know myself that, like... I can do it no matter what. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't matter like what I've eaten, what I, how much sleep I've gotten. Like I can still put out a really good performance. Um, but that was definitely the most the most nervous I had been, and I knew I just had to go guns blazing. Mm. Now that you've had time to reflect on your your high school, your college, your your Olympic experience, mm-hmm. you're getting ready to get into the work world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Looking back, what what are some of the things you would you would tell someone who's just starting on the journey, mm-hmm. um, taking the same path that you have taken? Mm-hmm. Um, I would not recommend doing your MBA at the same time as training for the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would recommend that to anybody. I wouldn't change what happened for the world, but I wouldn't recommend that one. What I would say for a younger person is to keep trying. I mean, the biggest thing is always, you know, rowing is a sport that uh, it gives back, It you get out of it how much you put in it. Mm-hmm. It rewards working hard. And I would just say that you have, you know, you have to give it 100% and that you will learn a lot out of yourself for how, what you're capable of by pushing yourself to the limits of and then you'll realize those limits actually keep growing and you can keep going and I think that's a really incredible thing to learn about yourself Um, and the other thing would be to stay open-minded always and that the you can work really really hard but if you're not coachable Mm -hmm. then it's quite challenging and so you need to be able to take feedback and take criticism and work to improve on it and that's something that can be challenging for people at different times um but particularly in team boats there's a tend there can be a tendency to if the boat's you know rocking and rolling to blame someone else like oh it's because that person's not tapping down at the same time Mm -hmm. as everybody else whatever it is but you you always have to first look to what can I do Mm -hmm. to be better and that's something that the earlier you learn that lesson, the more successful you'll be. Mm-hmm. Do you do you still have that desire to be in Tokyo in 2020? You know, when I finished racing in Rio, I definitely knew that I was that I still loved racing. Right. So my love for racing isn't gone, mm-hmm. and I think that if my love for racing was gone, then I it would have made it a you know very easy decision and stuff. Um, so I know that my love for racing is still there. I do also know that I want to, I'm 25 and I want to start a career to some degree, but I, I love training and so I hope to train enough to, to keep it an option. It's definitely an option. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh, actually, welcome back. You've done a remarkable <laughs> job on Saturday night at the at the uh, 80th anniversary for the Bermuda Olympic Association. Thank you. Um, and it was good to see you. Thanks. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Shelly Pearson. Bye. <laughs> there you have it, an Olympian, Jay. A good weekend of sports. Sports in general is one that we often hear our leaders talk about, brings the country together. And we hope that this particular show, the Digital Sports Show, is one of those things that allows people to see, hear, and express how sports has changed their life. Well, the good thing is, just like the storm after the storm, us Bermudians were very resilient. And this is one thing with sports. It helps bring communities, clubs, youngsters, adults back together for common good and that's we saw that on display Thursday and Friday during Hurricane Nicole and it just bleeds over into our sports world so once again we just want to congratulate everybody who participated this weekend because obviously all the distractions leading into the weekend but also to all our EMO helpers all our service members who are out in the storm helping us get back together without you guys now we got lights thank you and that's it from the Digital Sports Show I'm your host Earl Baston Juggling Jay I'll see you next show.